We live in such a beautiful city, don't we? Hello, everybody. Welcome to Around San Diego, where we fill you in on everything you need to know. I'm Netta Irampour, filling in for Jenny Day today. A Chula Vista City Council member and her brother are facing criminal charges, including fraud, money laundering, and failing to file tax returns. We're talking about Andrea Cardenas and her brother, Jesus Cardenas. He was the former chief of staff to Councilman Stephen Whitburn. According to the district attorney, they used a federal program designed to help struggling businesses during the pandemic for their personal gain. The DA says the two allegedly applied for and received more than $176,000 from the government's Paycheck Protection Program in 2021, which were federal COVID relief funds through their consulting firm, Grassroots Resources. The DA says they claim to have 34 employees working for them, which according to them was not true. That's what the DA is alleging here. Those employees actually work for a marijuana dispensary. Now, Cardenas says are scheduled to be rearranged on November 9th. Local activist Shane Harris and his family looking for answers after a shooting over the weekend left his 17 year old niece paralyzed. Harris says his niece Brianna is a top student, a cheerleader and very involved in school. He says she did not have anything to do with the fight that she got mixed up in as she was leaving a Sweet 16 party on Saturday night. San Diego police say it happened on Winona Avenue just north of El Cajon Boulevard. During that fight, someone pulled out a gun and fired and one of those bullets hit Brianna's upper back. My baby girl did not deserve this. And we don't deserve this. If you are watching, I, I would love for you to turn yourself in. Police say they are still searching for the person responsible for that shooting. If you have any information on what happened, who's at fault there, you should contact police or Crime Stoppers. The University of San Diego announced its executive director of athletics, Bill McGillis, will be leaving the school for another professional opportunity. McGillis has led the USD athletics program since 2016 after coming here to San Diego from the University of Southern Mississippi. Now, in a statement, USD President James T. Harris III thanked McGillis for his efforts. The announcement comes just a week after a lawsuit was filed against USD by a former football player claiming sexual hazing in the locker room. We're going to have details on this coming up here later on in sports. A retired couple escaped from their home with just some clothes and their seven dogs, but unfortunately their home was destroyed in the Highland Fire. George Boyle says it was an ember carried by powerful winds that set his home on fire. This happened earlier this week. He says he tried to put out the fire himself with a garden hose before he realized it was too late, too dangerous to do that. Now Boyle and his wife have to figure out how they're going to start over. It's a loss. Uh, my wife makes um, patchwork quilts and all her sewing machines and uh, my tools, my welding equipment, all this stuff. Um, and just everything gone. There isn't anything left. Uh, you really feel for them. All of their home destroyed there. George and his wife paid that house off just six months ago. The Highland Fire has burned nearly 2,500 acres in Riverside County and is just 20% contained. Well, hundreds of new parking meters were turned on in Pacific Beach this week, but we did find that some of them don't work. The meters are in areas right along Garnett, near the beach, Cass, Fenwell, Baird Streets, pretty popular spots. They do cost $1.25 an hour with a two hour maximum. Now, they don't take cash, but they can accept cards. We found QR codes linking to a payment option were not actually working when this was all implemented, and then neither was Apple Pay for some of the meters. The city tells us they've ordered new QR QR code stickers and they're currently looking into that Apple Pay issue. Leaders say the meter money will be split between the city and the community of Pacific Beach with the cash helping fund projects like the PB Beach Shuttle. Because right now we're operating four vehicles in Pacific Beach, but we could use a lot more to transport a lot more people. Okay, so Discover Pacific Beach is who you just heard from, and they're running those shuttles. The meters are part of a pilot program. They're testing it out. After one year, the program could be expanded, or if deemed unsuccessful, then the meters would be removed. Loud motorcycles with modified exhaust systems. One woman downtown says the noise is waking her up at all hours of the night. CBS 8's Brian White working for you to find out what can be done about those late-night loud noises. 
People living here on Market Street tell me loud motorcycles making excessive noise during the overnight hours is a real problem around here. They want to see something done about it. They're making this insane racket that wakes you up out of bed, makes your dog go crazy, can frighten your children. It's really awful. A viewer sent in these videos of noisy motorcycles on Market Street. It's insanely loud. I live on the 12th floor of a building and I can hear it like I'm almost right there with them. 35 year old Lisa, who wants to go by her first name only and did not want to go on camera for fear of retribution, says the obnoxiously loud motorcycles are completely disruptive, especially at night. I think they're attention seekers and I think they need to seek attention in a way that doesn't disturb an entire community. She moved to San Diego in July and immediately noticed how loud some riders were day or night, including one time when three in a row passed right by her on the street. They made the car alarms go off and it was like some kind of torture. It was like putting an air horn next to your ear. I looked up the vehicle code in California and any motorcycle manufactured after 1985 cannot exceed 80 decibels of noise and they must have an adequate muffler to prevent that. They install these weird modifications that make their vehicles too loud. That's illegal too. No one can modify the exhaust system of a motor vehicle in a manner which will amplify or increase the noise emitted. So how do you stop it? New York City has installed decibel meters and cameras by the stoplights and whenever someone goes by making too much noise to the point that it's illegal, they get like filmed by the camera and it goes to a committee who then reviews the video and sends a notice to the vehicle owner. Which often results in fines. To implement something like that here, it would need city council approval first. So I put Lisa in touch with the Public Safety and Livable Neighborhoods Committee and she plans to attend their next meeting on November 15th. Working for you in downtown, Brian White, CBS 8. Well, the San Diego City Council has firm plans to make public restrooms more available in the downtown area. Members approved a response to a grand jury's recommendation in a meeting this week. The recommendations approved including expanding 24 seven access to restrooms and to hand washing stations, making an online map of the locations and posting those maps downtown so people know where to go. Council President Sean Elo Rivera says they are also looking at ways to save money to build more back bathrooms. The cost of maintenance has been a reason why the city has either closed restrooms in the past or not opened more. We, my office and my, again, don't think that that's a reason not to have restrooms open. The mayor's goal is to have bathrooms within a five minute walk from each other, but that's still being explored. The woman accused of stabbing a sleeping man on a trolley last week has pleaded not guilty. Police say Angelina Montez Strickland stabbed a 21 year old man in his chest at a trolley stop in La Jolla at the Nobel Drive station, the one closer to UTC. According to police, the man woke up and was able to get away to flag down security, but Strickland stayed on the trolley and was able to get away. Police arrested her a few days later. You see her in the courtroom there. We are now learning the attorney for a national city teacher accused of having sex with a student is trying to reach a plea deal with the DA's office. Jacqueline Ma was expected in court Thursday, but the hearing was postponed until the end of this month. Defense attorney Mario Vela tells us plea deal negotiations started yesterday, so they have not yet reached a deal. Yesterday, uh, we met with the district attorney's office and we began negotiations in this case. We submitted an, a very thorough and extensive mitigation packet for their consideration. Prosecutors say the former teacher of the year from Lincoln Acres Elementary had inappropriate relationships with two young boys, having sex with one and engaging in lewd behavior with the other. Lawyers say one of the main reasons both sides are working on a plea deal is to keep the boys from having to testify in court. Vela says he's confident a deal can be reached. There is new affordable housing now in San Ysidro. Take a look here. We're getting a first look at what the apartments look like. This development is already at 100% capacity. It's filled really quickly there. 64 families call this home now. The nonprofit Jamboree and city officials hosted a grand opening showing the community what affordable housing can look like. Pretty nice, right? Officials say this type of housing can help with the homelessness crisis in San Diego, and it can even save lives. 
specifically here, so close to the border, right? And as part of San Diego, San Diego has a housing crisis. They have a homelessness crisis. And so by providing this type of housing right here, and when you go through the waiting list to get in here through the coordinated entry system here in San Diego County, they're selecting folks who are coming from this area. Now, this building has 64 units. Again, 60 families have moved in. It has a mix, one, two, three bedroom apartments, laundry facilities, outdoor community areas, a little playground as well. It also has on-site services like ESL classes, job training, and even after school programs for kids. That can certainly help out a lot of parents who need to work. All over San Diego, there are police departments facing shortages of officers. None more though so, more so, I should say, than in Chula Vista. CBS 8's Shannon Handy dug into Chula Vista's low law enforcement numbers and found where other departments rank. Chula Vista is the second largest city in our county, yet has the lowest percentage of officers per capita. Outside San Diego, federal numbers show it is among the lowest nationwide. This has been an ongoing issue. When it comes to public safety, Chula Vista Mayor John McCann says ensuring there are enough officers patrolling the streets is paramount. So it is my number one priority. I reached out to McCann after uncovering some startling numbers showing just how few officers Chula Vista has. According to data we collected from both the FBI and local police departments, Chula Vista has 10.3 officers per 10,000 people. The national average is closer to 24. To compare, we looked at each police department in our county dating back to 2018. Here's what we found. Coronado is at the top of the list with 20.1 officers per capita. Chula Vista is at the bottom. In fact, one recent study by Walla Hub found Chula Vista had the lowest officer per resident ratio out of the 182 cities they looked at nationwide. McCann believes there's a variety of contributing factors, including the high cost of living in San Diego County and because the public's view towards police has changed. I have been opposed to the defund police and devalue the police. And the challenge is, is that there are a lot of people in their 20s, in their 30s, that don't see being a police officer as a favorable position. As for what's being done to help with hiring, for starters, McCann says officers are being offered more money to compete with other departments. Eventually, he'd like them to be within the top three police department salaries countywide. In April, we went off cycle and gave them a 5% uh, pay increase, and their contract is going to be up uh, and we're going to start negotiations early next year. The police department is also casting a wide net to fill the 26 open spots it currently has with a possibility of one day adding more. CBSA found a job posting advertised to students at MIT detailing a $5,000 moving bonus and a salary of up to $115,000 upon graduating from the police academy. Anybody that we believe is a qualified person, whether they're local or whether they're from back east, we would like to have them come to Chula Vista and apply. Despite its lack of officers, Chula Vista is actually considered one of the safest cities in our county. And according to that Walla Hub study, it ranks 54th in safety out of 182 cities nationwide. Reporting for CBS 8, I'm Shanna Handy. All right, now we are working to continuing our coverage of abandoned buildings across the county. You may remember we started with the blighted McDonald's in Ramona. Since then, you many of you have reached out telling us about other vacant buildings in your communities. So our Brian White working for you to find out what's being done with this one, the old Fry's Electronics Store right near Murphy Canyon Road. Both entrances to the old fries are blocked and gated off, as you can see here. Now, many of our viewers are wondering what's going on with the property. So I did some research. There's more to life than just an empty building sitting there. Nearly three years since this Fry's Electronics Store closed its doors for good, it's still sitting there empty with boarded up windows and doors. They're paying taxes, they got maintenance, they got upkeep, and they're bringing in no revenue. Something's going on. I went next door to the golf driving range and asked around for what people think should go in there. Maybe an indoor golf facility. How about like a Costco or something, a, a real big operation with, uh, it's got plenty of parking. I'd like to see it go back to retail. I called the county recorder's office and they told me the ownership is listed as Maverick Property Owner LLC, which is an out-of-state company formed in Delaware. Bay West Development is the agency handling the property, so I gave them a call. One of the agents told me there are plans underway for a massive 
of redevelopment, but he couldn't share any more than that. Mortgage records indicate a $38 million loan was taken out on the property in August. Whoever does go in there is going to have to uh, bring it back up to the newer standards and to uh, you know make it make it profitable. Meanwhile, last week, County Supervisor Joel Anderson sent a letter to his colleagues regarding their discussion on an unsafe camping ordinance. In it, he actually names the old Fry's property as a potential site to serve the homeless. Quote, it should include consideration of vacant properties such as the former Fry's electronic site in the city of San Diego, end quote. I think there's other facilities that would be better located than right there that doesn't really have a lot of access to uh, facilities facilities around here. So I called Supervisor Anderson's office and staff told me it was just a suggestion at this point. I then confirmed with Bay West Development that the property will definitely not be used for the county's safe camping program or any other type of homeless shelter. From an economic standpoint, you have to get that thing filled some way or somehow. As for what will go in here, Bay West tells me they may be able to share more after the first of the year. We'll keep you posted. Working for you, Brian White, CBSA. Yeah, you know, Brian White will be on top of that and let you know what's going on there. And now we have a working for you follow up success to share. For more than a year, a Tecolote Canyon neighborhood fought for stop signs on Via Las Cumbres, a street with a blind spot, speeding cars, a lot of crashes. That's what the neighbors were saying. So they were having no luck before our Brian White directed them to the Linda Vista Planning Group. That planning group took it up the chain. Now they have their stop signs and look, a crosswalk and many of them feel safer in their neighborhood. So yes, thank you to Brian White for working hard and our whole CBS 8 crew doing this. Remember, we want to help solve problems that affect you. So if there's something that you want us to look into, you can email us at the email on your screen. An easy one to remember, working for you at CBS8.com. Turning now to this, some new developments in a missing persons case involving a former Navy SEAL and a Chinese tourist. More human remains were found in the Anza Borrego Desert over the weekend. CBS 8's David Godferson talked to an attorney who says he believes the remains are of the missing woman, Feng Jin. The Anza Borrego Desert can be a very unforgiving place, especially in the summer months when temperatures can rise above 115 degrees. Former Navy SEAL John Fitzpatrick and Chinese tourist Fang Jin mysteriously went missing in late July. Shortly thereafter, his four-wheel drive Toyota pickup was found abandoned in Anza Borrego, south of the Harper Flat area. Now CBS 8 has learned Jim's remains may have been found in the area. Fitzpatrick's remains were discovered in September in Harper Canyon. All indications are that they found remains on Saturday. Attorney David Schmidt got word of the discovery from a private investigator hired by Jim's family. You have a 47-year-old woman with two beautiful daughters, one in college, the other a young girl, something like seven years old, and all of a sudden they don't have a mother. And so it, it hits you that it, it's a tragedy. Jin flew to California in July from her home in China to meet up with 52-year-old Fitzpatrick, who lived in Morongo Valley. She came here for romantic purposes, had been uh, texting him for for something like six months prior to coming here and they definitely had rapport and her expectation was that he was going to show her around the area morongo valley morongo basin joshua tree state park and see whether the relationship developed schmidt has been involved in the case and says the san diego sheriff's department notified jen's family of the discovery but not the public San Bernardino County Sheriff emailed me a statement saying, quote, human remains were located over the weekend in the Anza Borrego area. However, no positive identity of the remains has been reported to us. I rode out to Fish Creek Wash in Anza Borrego over the weekend. Did you see an abandoned blue pickup truck, Toyota? A law enforcement source told me Fitzpatrick's pickup truck is still out there and it's going to take a helicopter to get it out. David Godfredson, CBS 8. 
hoping to solve that mystery there. Well, tonight, local leaders are warning that the hundreds of millions of dollars President Biden is requesting to fix the Tijuana River crisis will not be enough. We're talking about all that sewage that we see impacting our South Bay. CBS 8's Jasmine Ramirez spoke with the mayors of Coronado and Imperial Beach about the growing repair bill to stop the cross-border sewage overflows. The $310 million requested would go towards infrastructure maintenance and repairs that would help stop sewage flows from the Tijuana River. Sewage from the Tijuana River shuts down beaches in Imperial Beach and Coronado every year. Sometimes the smell is overwhelming. It's just a nasty garbage smell. It just makes me so sad. I love this town. Pam has lived in IB for more than 70 years and knows the sewage problem all too well. We have to do the work. Mexico will not fix it. It's an international crime, but we have to be in charge of the plan. Obviously, it's in uh, environmental concerns, but also uh, affects our U.S. Navy SEALs, affects our uh, Border Patrol agents, and it affects our local economies as well. The mayor of Coronado, Richard Bailey, says this new $310 million emergency request to Congress would be on top of $300 million Congress allocated in 2020. That money was supposed to be used to upgrade the South Bay International Wastewater Treatment Plant. However, local leaders recently learned there's a backlog of work needed before expansion can happen. It wasn't revealed until a few a couple months ago that the there's extreme deferred maintenance, there's rehabilitation costs, the plant is in a complete state of disrepair, and now they need almost $150 million just to fix it. Imperial Beach Mayor Paloma Aguirre says the estimated cost to complete the deferred maintenance and upgrade the plant is likely close to $1.5 billion. The president's $310 million emergency request is only a step, and Congress still needs to approve it. It's incumbent upon all of us to advocate and raise our voices so that we can get this not only passed on through Congress, but so that we can get President Biden to declare a state of emergency. She says funding is especially important as we approach the winter months and see more rain that can increase sewage spills. Jasmine Ramirez, CBS 8. And now a new French themed community is coming to Bonzo. It's called the Haven Community, founded by minority owners of the Houston Astros. Developers say this North County neighborhood will have 165 new homes. Take a look at this. It's a vineyard, a golf course, but they say the biggest draw is that all this luxury comes at what they're calling an attainable price. The price range starts in the high 900s, um, so right around a million and, and up. It's incredible. I mean, you just really can't find pricing like that anywhere else, especially in such a unique community. Yeah, the median price in San Diego, just under a million. So we can see why she's calling that attainable. The home comes with a one year membership at a nearby country club, which just underwent a $15 million renovation. Soft opening is in December. A grand opening will happen there in February in Bonzo. And now a young surfer from Encinitas breaking barriers going for the gold. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen introduces us to this teenager. Look at those moves. He's now the first Filipino American young man to make it onto the U.S. Junior National Surf Team. Yes, I talked with 18 year old San Diego High School student Titus Santucci and get this. His surfing journey started when he was just nine years old. Titus Santucci grew up in a surfing family, surfing alongside his parents as a little boy in Encinitas. My dad always used to push me into waves and so did my mom. And so it was cool to be able to grow up with them and have them like bring me into the surfing world and, and kind of teach me everything I knew. After riding the waves for nine years and competing in numerous competitions, he received a call that would change his life. He qualified for the U.S. Junior National Surf Team out of hundreds hundreds who tried out from different leagues and he's the first Filipino American man in San Diego to do so. I'm super stoked to be the first uh, male Filipino American on the team. I mean, it's super cool to be able to like represent my culture and everything. Two other San Diegans, Cole McCaffrey and Lucas Osten also made the team. Yeah! Titus's mother, Irene, couldn't be more proud of her son. Oh my gosh, I, I am so proud. And to actually see his hard work pay off, 
Um, it's just, it's, it's incredible. Filipinos stick like rice, you know? And they support each other. And once one does good, we're all super stoked. It's super important. Like, it's, it's cool to have, like, the whole Filipino community and, like, my family and everything behind me. They will be heading to Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, later this month to compete in the International Surfing Association's Junior National Championship, where surfers from more than 50 nations will be competing. He's hoping to raise money for his travels and other expenses in Brazil. Oh, we're trying to raise money so that we can get to Brazil and compete and be ready to win gold. And his first choice for a snack when he hopefully takes home the gold? A Filipino delicacy, of course. Some like nice crispy lumpia with some sweet and sour sauce is always a good go-to. <laughs> to help Titus and his team as they head to Rio, Brazil, we've posted some helpful links at CBS8.com. Reporting from Solana Beach, I'm Ariana Cohen for CBS8. And now this new video shot by a remote operated vehicle giving us a never before seen glimpse of our oceans at twilight. As CBS 8's Evan Arani tells us, it could be giving us valuable information on the implications of climate change. It's a view humans rarely get to see. About 100 meters below the ocean's surface, a whole different world booming with life and now in stunning clarity. I can't tell you how thrilling those moments are because remember, we don't get that in real time, okay? You know, we don't, we don't know up on the ship, you know, that Mesobot doesn't send us a text message and say, hey, I think I saw a shark. Dr. Dana Yerger is a senior scientist at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution and has been working to uncover what video like this can tell us about our ocean. Literally, we can do biodiversity surveys. We can, you know, ask basic questions of who's around, okay? And we can ask those questions in a number of different ways. Starting with, let's go look around. The remote operated vehicle called Mesobot helps paint a more complete picture of the delicate balance of ocean life, including its inhabitants. At, at first, you know, I was talking with our, our media relations people and they were like, oh, we found these, we got these pictures of rare animals. I said, no, 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 no. These animals are not rare. We rarely get to see them. Okay, that's the point. These are, in fact, the most numerous abundant animals on the face of the earth. It can also help us understand the carbon cycle responsible for moving CO2 from the atmosphere to the deep ocean and what that could mean for the future of our climate. They're carrying that carbon deep in the ocean. Okay, they're essentially removing it, which, which from the point of view of regulating the CO2 in the atmosphere is, um, is an important thing. But there is still a lot more to learn and many more explorations to do. Scientists say while explorations like this show how far technology is progressing, we're still barely scratching the surface. All of those ways of, of looking at the ocean are valuable, but on their own incomplete. The, the power of what we do comes when we take all of those observations and we combine them. So we look at the visual images, we look at the sonar, we look at the physical oceanographic measurements, we, we look at the eDNA, the environmental DNA, and we try to link all that together so we can make a, a, a more complete picture of what's going on in the ocean. With future expeditions from Mesobot, more info can be gathered and ideally help in making decisions about how to make the world better for both us and marine life. My focus is on uh, you know, working with a small group of scientists and and really advancing our knowledge of, of, of what's going on in this. Uh, it's the biggest living space on the planet. I think I, I, I shouldn't need to justify why we, we need to know more about it. Evan Arani, CBS 8. Such a mystery in the deep sea, but they're working to figure it out. Uh, just ahead of Veterans Day, a local Korean war, war veteran's widow getting renovations done to the home she and her husband lived in for more than 60 years. It's all part of Habitat for Humanity's Vet Repairs Program. More than 20 volunteers coming together to make these home improvements. They're working hard there. Volunteers say it's important to get out and work on critical repairs on local homes so families here can stay in affordable houses that they've been in for years.
This is a key part of our mission. San Diego Habitat doesn't just build homes, but we also want to preserve homes. Each home that we preserve stays affordable for the family who lives there, and they get to have a safe, affordable home for the rest of their lives. Volunteers were able to repaint parts of that house. They're repainting the fencing and working on that landscaping. Students from Castle Park and Sweetwater High Schools got a chance to gain firsthand experience and connect with inspiring professionals in various STEM paths. This was all part of the American Heart Association's STEM Goes Red program. And our Colleen Murphy was there for this Innovate 8 report as students got to learn more about STEM opportunities from people who remind them of themselves. When the heart doesn't beat, it can't pump blood to the brain, the lungs, and all of your other organs. Today's event is our second opportunity to host a STEM Goes Red, which is an experience for high school students to get exposed to careers in science, technology, engineering, and math. And now you're going to push. And you actually want to hear it click, yeah. It is an opportunity for them to change their life, and it could be life-changing, and we want their input into the innovation for health equity for all. Some people that don't really know what to do with their career, once they come to events where they like get to see other people and what they do, it really sparks their interest in that certain field. There's a lot of cartilage actually through the sternum. So Seeing other people with like the same backgrounds as me or like similar backgrounds, it's really inspiring. You have to see it to be it. And so for a lot of these young girls or you know even young boys who maybe they haven't been exposed to you know uh, STEM professionals, whether they're engineers or chemists or doctors that look like them. How are the wheels going to spin? They'll meet people, you know, professionals who maybe have the same background as them or look like them or can encourage them, give them that boost of confidence to say, hey, I can do it too. I feel like it opens many opportunities for kids to like discover new careers that they've never known. So have you made sure that the wheels actually like touch the ground? It pushes you, it motivates you to see that there are women out there that come from different backgrounds that have been through many obstacles. Ready, ready, ready. So we hope these kids get excited about a career in science and innovation. Perfect, that's good. And they're going to be one of the ones that helps to improve cardiovascular health for everyone. Learning some life-saving skills right there. Thanks to Colleen Murphy for that. Uh, right now, a family in Cardiff is on the lookout for Halloween vandals that hit their home. The Kassar family puts up elaborate decorations every year. They knocked him down and the head is broken and everything is all messed up. So yeah, somebody messed with their decor this year. Somebody keeps knocking down their giant skeletons. Look at those big ones they have out there. It first happened last week, then again over the weekend, breaking some of the decorations beyond repair. The family says they have video from home security cameras and have contacted the San Diego County Sheriff's Department. Deputies tell us because of the amount of damage, the vandals could face felony charges. Well, it is like a scene from the movie Edward Scissorhands, and it is right here in San Diego. If you have not seen this already, you must check it out. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen introducing us to Harper's Topiary Garden in Middletown near Mission Hills as she rhymes her way through this unique spot. It's the night before Halloween and more than 52 plant figures remain to be seen. It's like when you're looking at clouds and you see all these things in the clouds, you know, and you go, oh, that looks like a, an elephant. What do you see? Bunnies, elephants, and whales, oh my. That's what keeps this Middletown garden alive. You're looking at my creation of a topiary garden. They call her Edna Scissorhands as a nickname, and since then her plants have never been the same. They're Cape Honeysuckle, it's a vine. I'm not the scissor hands anymore. <laughs> I just drew it. <laughs> a look at her front yard before in 1969. You know, when you're an artist, you can see things. She illustrated pictures inspired by her travels to make it look this divine. So I went to the Orient many times, and I went to uh, Thailand and 
Singapore. And oh, you can see many things like spooks and goblins and flapping wings. They like it because it's you know, bringing notoriety to the neighborhood. And people come from all over the world to see it. This Halloween, you may see the secret mailbox and other hidden gems. At 3549 Union Street, just look beneath the stems. Come what may, come what might, these plants are here to stay and they won't cause a fright. I'm Ariana Cohen for CBS 8. It may look like a zoo, but I'll toss it back to you. Way to go, bravo to Ariana, rhyming her way through that. What an incredible sight to see there. And yes, as always, thank you so much for sticking around here, watching around San Diego. We are working for you to try to keep you informed on all things our city. So for CBS 8, I'm Netta Irampar. Have a great day.